Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so today's topic is about efficient collaboration. Um, and what we will be talking about is like the some coding standards and techniques that there are, um, the importance of uniform styling of your code. Um, the, we want to understand the value that it, we have of using Git and GitHub, um, how to minimize the risk and maximize the benefits of collaborative R programming, and some suggestions of how uh, you might approach a big project with other people. Um, so let's start with five tips that uh, the book gave us. So we have, um, they suggested to have like a consistent coding style. So whenever you work on a project, you should try to keep it consistent. And when you're working with like other people, you should try to like at least find a compromise um, because some people prefer other coding styles, but it makes it much easier if you're like, trying to be more uniform throughout the project. Um, you should think carefully about the comments that you're making and always update them along with the code that you're doing. And we will talk more about that in uh, later today. Um, whenever it's possible, you should use version control to um, have a better, an easier time to um, follow along your project or go back and forth. And don't be afraid to talk to your colleagues and ask for feedback or give them feedback as well, since this can be really helpful. And this, we will also talk about that later today. So um, let's start with the uh, code formatting. So there are a few things um, that are recommended to do. So for example, you should use indentation to make it easier to read. Um, so the way you do it is, you do just two spaces to indent the code, or if you haven't done it, you can just like use a shortcut um, to mark the text and then it will do it. I will do it automatically for you. Um, so it's also helpful to try to limit your code per line since the longer you make it, the harder it will be to read. So just try to uh, use new lines, um, especially. If for example, when you're, use, when you're using the pipes, always use a new line when you're like after a new pipe. And you should also try to avoid mixing tabs and spaces. R is usually doing that all um, by itself. I mean, it, it, it makes sense if you try to do it like on the same line to align something, but usually just use one or the other. And also if you use spacing in between, it makes uh, your code more re readable. So for example, if we look below, instead of, so you should always try to do like the, this bracket always, it the, sh should never stand alone. And the closing bracket should always stand alone, except if you're like using else, then you should put them in the one line and then the code that you're having in between. And uh, to go more deep into the spacing, um, it's recommended to do spacing around, generally around all the operators. Um, if it's like plus or minus or the assignments or comparison operators, it really um, helps with not only readability, but also helps to avoid causing any bugs that you might not see. Uh, it's also recommended to add a space after a comma, like you would do in like the normal English language. And exception to the rule are um, those uh, columns and of course the, the dollar sign and the add sign. So uh, this is an example the book gives about like possible bugs that could um, turn up if you're like not using any spaces. So for example, here it misidentifies this as an assignment operator, even though it's like meant to be just a comparison between X and negative one. So um, it's not only easier to read, but it's also uh, avoiding errors. Um, okay. Um, so another suggestion that I gave is uh, about loading packages. So in general, you should try to to load packages always at the beginning of your code 
and then try to avoid using the require and use library uh, because library will give you a warning if something's not installed, but with require, they don't necessarily give it to you. So you will need to make sure that you have, uh, that you remember to capture the warnings. And it would also be, it's also recommendable to only load the packages that you need. And if you think that you're using too many packages, you should also consider to create a separate file with just your libraries and then um, um, load them into your uh, file, like with storage. Um, so. Um, feel free to, to like add anything that you might know about coding style or anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've had a couple oh. of things in the chat. Um, oh, yeah. Laura's sure. pointed out the Styler package, which is super useful. It's, it has an RStudio add on. Um, you can just run, like, uh, have it style um, a directory or a, a package that you're writing or things like that. And um, that's really handy. Um, I pointed out that for the 80 character thing, there is a, a setting in our studio that'll show you a line at 80 um, mm -hmm. to keep things or keep it easy to, to find that. And then one I didn't say in chat is kind of for all of this, there's um, our stats.wtf. Uh, what they forgot to teach you in R is the, it's like a um, workshop that Jenny Bryan has done a few times. Mm -hmm. um, it has, like the whole book is basically, or to a large degree, it's this chapter. Like it's going into detail of uh, rules to use for uh, code readability and um, reproducibility and things like that. So I really recommend that book. And then um, there's a package called Good Practice that wraps style, or actually it doesn't wrap styler, but it wraps code coverage and uh, uh, linter and a whole bunch of other packages to kind of check that you're, uh, if you're writing a package, to check that you're following all these various rules that um, are helpful to have. So I find I use good practice in Styler really extensively when I'm writing packages to keep everything consistent. That's um, pretty cool. I've never wrote a package myself, so that will definitely come in handy. <laughs> 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 okay yeah cool um, okay and then also in the chat is mentioned that there are like uh different packages and functions that will oh that's cool okay definitely need to check them out <laughs> <laughs> okay so next let's talk a little bit about commenting which is uh Clearly, very helpful, and you should definitely do it because they can improve efficiency. And not only your collaborators, but also your future self will be thankful because usually you're working on so many projects and going back and forth, or maybe need to go back uh, like one or two months later. And um, in the moment you're coding, it makes total sense, but then later you're like, okay, what 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 did I want to do here? Why am I doing that? Um, so because of that, it's also important to do, do it the right way. Like you should try to provide context and not code explanation, meaning, um, say, describe the why you're doing something and not the what you're doing. So, um, because the code usually, um, when you're able to read the code, you, you see what you're doing, but you don't know why you're doing it. Like why you're filtering something, why you're assigning something. Those are all things that will make it give everyone an easier time to um, under like follow you along, follow your decisions, and also like proofreading in the end. Um, then also um, try to not do too many comments. Like if you're doing a comment of, after every line, it might also defeat the purpose. Um, and as I said at the beginning, it's. When you update the code, you also need to make sure that you're updating comments and the meaning changes. So it will also add more work. Um, and then it's also recommended whenever you're doing a comment, you can you use a hashtag and then one space after it. Um, and I think there's also like a shortcut. I think like Control Shift and C is how you can like uh, out 
comment something of your code. Uh, and another uh, helpful thing to know is the, the hashtag with a space and then three of uh, four of the dashes, which enables code folding. I mean, it's basically like when you're using um, R Markdown or Quattro, you, you can do your code chunks in and out, but you can also edit within your code chunk and then say, okay, this section, I want to be separately able to just hide or um, see whenever it's like useful to maybe get a easier readability of um, what you're doing. Um, yeah, and if you're not using it with like, within a code chunk, you should also do it at the end of what you want to fold because otherwise it will go like either until the end of your code chunk or until you're doing it again. Uh, um, yeah, just to add, so this, uh, I mean, I think it's the same thing, but in a different word that uh, when in your uh, R script, uh, even in, in the R script, uh, when you use this uh, four dashes in the end, it creates a new section, uh, mm -hmm. which you can see in your um, right side, I think index it's called. Um, so along with code folding, it also makes it easier for you to access your code, up, you know, going up and down uh, in case of debugging. So that's usually very helpful. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Um, yeah, and it also helps to put like uh, uh, headers in between your sections because there you can always like, like you can do it word, you can choose the section that you want to go into your in your code, and jump back and forth. Yeah, uh, so sort of resonating with what you said, you know, adding some explanation or sorry, adding some context and, you know, in terms of your short section names instead of adding any explanations there. Exactly, so yeah. Kind of matches with that, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, and um, closely related to that is like uh, how you name certain, certain things. Um, so there's, um, so the next thing is first, let's talk about naming files. Um, there was a quote that I found that says there, there are only two hard things in computer science. It's cache and validation and naming things. And, um, I mean, naming can really be a science for itself. There are so many, uh, possibilities, how to name something, how to name something wrong, or like you shouldn't make it too long, but not too short. You should use use follow names and um, also should, you should also keep in mind that you should not do any spaces in between because it can give our or otherwise a hard time to, to read it. Um, you should, it's also like the, the book says to recommend all lower, make everything all lowercase and use like the, the, the down, the slashes on the bottom to, uh, to connect your words. Um, and also, if you have uh, files that you need to run in sequence, it, it helps to adjust the uh, attach a prefix like okay zero one and then the name of the file and zero two and the name of the file. Um, yeah, I'm I'm sure. Yeah, so similar is when when you're like uh, naming objects objects. It's like helping. It's supposed to have the reader to follow along your project. And if you're doing it right, it can improve the project efficiency. So you should always choose your names consistently consistently and sensibly, um, especially if there are objects that you're using often in your code. So when you give it a name that, that says what it is containing, that makes it much easier to follow along or to relate to earlier in the code as compared to when you just call them like X, double X, three X, it's like, you never know what it's supposed to mean. Um, and here also it's um, recommended to, to use the underscore separated format as you can see here, but that's also just a preference and there are different uh, ways to do it. There are people that prefer to just put everything together in lowercase. There are, there's the option to, um, put everything together, but every word start with an uppercase letter. Um, so there are definitely different ways to go about that. Um, but one recommendation is to 
really prefer the underscore as compared to using a point because um, apparently in Python, the point has like another, it, it's just another, it works differently and it might con confuse them if they read the code. Um, so I'm, I'm not using Python, so I can't really say more about that, but uh, feel free. <laughs> um, it's also confusing to use periods in R because um, uh, S3 methods, which are like an advanced advanced technique, but they use the period that like it function name, the period in the function name has meaning. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're not working with Python people, uh, periods can make code really confusing to read in some cases, which is funny because, uh, you know, data dot frame is one of the like basic components of R and that period can make some code really confusing to read. Um, so never make a thing called a frame uh, because then it would get confused with data.frame in some cases. Um, so yeah, that's just periods are bad <laughs> in names <laughs> of things. Yeah. Good now that said, I, I use a, a style where you use a period at the start uh, to indicate that it's like not exported from packages. And also mm -hmm. a period at the start also hides things in your panel in our studio, which isn't, it can be good and it can be bad <laughs> depending on how you look at it. But it, if it's something that's kind of like in the background, I tend to put a period at the start of the name. Um, and then, yeah, uh, Gus, said in chat that um, he finds it helpful for keeping names straight to break everything into functions where the function name says what it does um, and assigns a name uh, or an object with a similar name. So like stuff gets get stuff and mm -hmm. the function would be get stuff. Um, things like that, that can be, uh, yeah, that can be helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, um, and then um, ha having said all of that, it's you should also try to avoid to name anything after like common functions because that could also uh, confuse things or maybe even reassign things that you don't want to be reassigned. Uh, and you should also use to always use true, try to use always true and false instead of just the TNF, uh, which is also something if you could easily say, okay, F equals 10. And then if you say something should be false, then it's just 10 or I don't know, it's just easily un reassigned. But if you try to reassign something like false, it would give you an error. Um, it's just an additional thing safe, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, and then object assignments. Um, here it's really, you can, it's, it's, you can use it interchangeably pretty much always like either the arrow or the equal sign. So uh, personally, I, I prefer the arrow, but uh, the book seems to go with the equal notation to um, be closer to other coding languages and such. Um, but I guess it's really just a preference. I resisted the arrow for a long time because it seems so arbitrary and weird, but I, I really like it now because if you're trying to find where something is assigned rather than it happens to match the name of an argument somewhere, you can mm -hmm. search for the, you know, expert one arrow and that's different than expert one equals. Like it, it has different meaning um, mm -hmm. and I like that. So uh, yeah, I am a fan of the arrow. Uh, I wouldn't be without our studio, I don't think. Like if I'm using some other editor and I can't alt minus for the arrow, it drives me crazy because it I lose that, you know, one key. I don't even like yeah. know how to type it. Like I guess I can, but my hands don't do that yeah, yeah, easily. Yeah. I, I just alt minus automatically. Yeah, I think I just I, I just automatically do option minus on the <laughs> map and it's just life saving. And uh, on this, I think I had this one um sort of challenge uh, and I don't recall the exact situation, but it is somewhere when, you know, you're creating a data frame on your own um, and you create a variable 
and you do equal to, I think that's the right way to do it, but you cannot use arrow in that state. Meaning inside, when you are creating a data frame manually and then column assignment um, wouldn't work with an arrow. I, I think that's, that's what it should be. And uh, I had probably done it, done this when I was in a situation where I figured I, you know, some, there was something wrong. Um, but also I think, um, so, so creating that data frame with all the variable names being assigned equal to certain value and whatnot. In some cases, even that, um, I don't know how to explain this, but let's, let's skip that. But yeah, I think inside the data frame, the arrow thing definitely doesn't work. So that that's one place where interchangeably would be incorrect for this particular scenario. Yeah. Um, like it, it kind of works, which is the worst. <laughs> like, so you won't know, necessarily know that something broke. Uh, the tidyverse, um, well, actually, it's the was I think it's the CLI package somewhere. They have a thing that will automatically warn you if you're using arrow, where you probably meant to use equals, um, which I is helpful. In our studio options somewhere, I remember. Oh, well, it's that yeah, as it's well. Under the code diagnostics yeah. panel. It says check usage of assign. Oh, that actually might be something different. Okay, it's usage of arrow assignment in function call. But um, yeah, that's that. So the oh, data frame true. thing um, that it'll, yeah, it'll, so our studio will put a little like warning flag on in the code, but at, there's, I was just reading code somewhere where there's an option in, I think in our lang to, to have things error out when you, or at least warn when you use arrow for assignment um, because there are cases where you know, like uh, the thing that I put in chat where you can do it. And if that's in the middle of a pipeline, it won't throw any errors um, with, with BASAR, but it's not doing what you would think that you're doing. <laughs> and so when you go to select column A from that data frame, column A, or sorry, column X doesn't exist uh, because you didn't use equals. So you didn't name the column. Um, so yeah, that kind of thing. And then Gus also pointed out that there's the backwards arrow uh, in R, which is sometimes useful. So you can use it at the end of a pipe, for example, to assign stuff to the pipe. Um, and then... Just the lore yeah. about yeah. why it exists. <laughs> Do you know why old things in base R don't use underscores in names? Because underscore used to be assignment. So you couldn't use underscore in names. And then they realized, oh, this was a terrible idea. We need to undo this. <laughs> oh, wow. Is that why some functions have a, have a point in there previously, but then like, yeah, for example, but... link CSV, I, I've seen like the point and the underscore, which was always confusing. So. Yeah, the point is the base R and then the underscore is yeah. read R. Okay. Um, and yeah, so they used point, but then point had other meaning or acquired other meanings uh and just using underscore for assignment is weird <laughs> you know so which it does make me wonder if uh it's going to lead to any problems now that underscore is the placeholder for the base pipe um that's going to cause similar issues so um i mean not that the dot as a placeholder is necessarily any better uh Anyway, yeah. John, to uh, your point, um, so underscore is read R, and I'm not sure if read R is part of Tidyverse, but there are other, other functions also, like if else, where uh, if else without underscore is base R, but if underscore else is dplyr. Yes. Right, yeah. yeah they, part of what the Tidyverse, you know, like part of their uh philosophy of making things tidy is they use the uh snake case for naming so that's easier to read um so yeah you'll see a lot of underscores in tidyverse function names um and i guess for completion the other there are also the um assignments with uh double less than or double greater than which assigns it like in the environment above where you're doing the assignment 
um, almost always, if you're doing that, you're probably hacking around something. Uh, but there are a few cases where it is useful. Well, then isn't should we talk also about Walrus operator? There's That's so yeah. Funny. There's also the um, colon equals for some uh, tidyverse. Well, um, non-standard evaluation things. Um, I want to see if I can do a real quick example. Um, no, oh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to get something to copy and paste. I can't quickly get something, but um, that's not working well. Anyway, so colon equals, it's for, it, I don't, I can't make a real quick example to show, and maybe someone else will, but it's, uh, it lists the left side of the um, name, like the part that's supposed to be the name. Normally it has to just be a string or a name, you know, like a bare name. And with colon equals, it like processes that before it does the assignment. So you can use that to um, use variables for, very, um, for the name of the column in a data frame and things like that. Um, that's a fairly like advanced situation and you'll probably uh, run into it in other things, but um, yeah, okay, there's a... <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can use it for, for tidy evaluation, which is a uh, whole other thing. All right, and then we also had, oh yeah, super assignment. Um, and then yeah, within Magritter, there is actually the pipe assignment where you can pipe and assign. Um, so you could say, you know, empty cars, pipe assign filter, it it writes over empty cars with the filtered version of empty cars. Um, I like probably there are cases where that would be cleaner and better, but I always just end up with empty cars, arrow empty cars, and then the pipe. Um, partly again because of hotkeys. I don't have a hotkey for the pipe assigned, so therefore I never use it. <laughs> All right. I think that's our full aside on assignment. <laughs> Okay, cool. So now that we've talked about a lot of the, the styling um, of the code, let's go into the next uh, big topic of the version control. Um, so this is very useful to uh, not only to keep track of your progress, um, but also make it easier to collaborate with other people when, especially when a project gets really large um, or and therefore complicated. And also if it's like really, critical to keep track of the changes. It also keeps a backup of your code. So you can always go back to see what your code looked like a month ago. Um, so in general, for version control, you can either, either use a shell or for example, in our studio, there, there's a Git tab that you can use. Um, it's, uh, in this case, it's also, uh, important to um, document your work with clear and concise commit messages. Um, commits are like the basic units of version control. Um, and it's recommended to keep them like atomic, meaning that one commit should, should only do one thing. Um, and um, then after you have committed it, you you need to push it so that it's updated on the server. Um, and if you use the deploy, you get the latest version of the repository on your uh, computer. Uh, I mean, I guess everybody here knows how to do it because uh, also just to create this, we, we all have used GitHub. Um, <laughs> so um, GitHub is also the, the most popular version control that is being used. Um, especially in the R community, like pretty much everybody who writes a package or anything, you, you will find an account of him on GitHub. Um, 
you can also use GitHub to to install and update like those packages. Um, yeah, and as I already said, you, you can share your work and collaborate on code. You can even work simultaneously on the same code with others. Um, you, but it's also important to not like impose using GitHub on your collaborators. There are all, always those that um, are not really comfortable with using it, or even if they are trying to use it, they uh, sometimes it just ends up making more problems than like solving anything. Um, so it might be nice to, to do it uh, with people who know how it works or if it's just like a smaller project to get them used to it uh, or if you have some time to, to teach them the ropes. Um, then um, as I also already said, it's, uh, it's very helpful to agree on a common style upfront. So for example, that everybody uses the arrow instead of the equal sign for assignment and such things. Um, so um, yeah, GitHub is like, it offers a vast amount of possibilities. So it takes, takes quite some time to get deep into it to understand all the possibilities. Um, personally, I'm also just, starting to to scratch the surface of all the options github gives us um but it's definitely um if you like want to start with it it's always helpful to know some of the basics uh, especially things like um like branches and forks so for example a branch is the it's just a distinct version of your repository and and forks is pretty much the same thing only that it's just existing on your own computer and you cannot push anything on a fork of someone else, um, the way I understand it. Um, then you can also create like a clone where you create an exact, exact copy of the repository um, where it might be also be useful to, to clone a fork instead of the whole original repository. Um, and then when you're working on forks, there's uh, something called a pull request where you then, when you're finished, you're working on your fork, you ask to add code to the existing project, which also provides the opportunity for others working on this project to um, look into your code, maybe make some comments or other things before merging it into the big project. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all I know about GitHub. Um, I'm sure, uh, especially when you're like creating your own packages, you have used it for a lot of other things as well. Um, I, I am a big fan of using, use this to deal with all the GitHub and Git stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Very rarely I use like the command line or I uh, forget, but most of the time like use this just helps to avoid errors. It tells you what you're doing wrong. It, uh, you know, flags things that are weird. So it's very helpful. And I don't know, it's very funny because I can tell people who uh, know better and they know how to use GitHub and they're not going to use, use this because they're, they're, um, commits are, or their pull requests are harder to merge. They're more likely to have mistakes. If you use, pull, uh, use this, it, I mean, you know, to a, to a point. Um, but if you use, use this, it stops you from doing a lot of things that would, that make things difficult. So um, big fan of pull, use this. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely helpful. The, the way you mentioned how to set up this, uh, this whole project and which used this to use. And it was like the first time I've used it and it was really making everything easier easier than the way I usually did it, so. Excellent. <laughs> Glad to hear it. That was really nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so if there's nothing else to say about uh, GitHub, then we go to the come to the last topic, which is the uh, code review. 
Um, so here, um, the book mentioned four questions that should always be considered when you're reviewing your other people's code. So this is, is the code correctly and properly documented, which goes back to you to the comment section we've talked about. Um, then could the code be improved? Um, this, this could be different things. And depending on it, it's important to be like, if, uh, if your code runs quickly or not, it might also include some uh, computational efficiency, but if that's not very important, then you could maybe just do a suggestion if you have one. Um, then also, does the code conform to existing style guidelines? Also, what we've talked to before, if there might be some major problems in the code that make it really hard to read. And also, if there are any automated tests in your code and if they are, are they sufficient? Um, so if when you're doing a review, it's always important to uh, go about it the right way. Um, so a, a good code review shares knowledge and best practices and doesn't like talk down a person. It's more like constructive feedback. It suggests improvement. It may, might also give, give praise when it's appropriate, especially if someone's like new to coding, it really helps helps them to, to keep going. <laughs> Out of my own experience, like when you're starting, it's just, uh, there's all, you always do stuff wrong. Even if you're like more experienced later, it's, there can always be something that's not going right. Um, then when you're reviewing something, it, it's helpful to set a time frame or amount of lines that you want to review for yourself. So for example, I will now review this code for like an hour or just the first 400 lines. Um, and if you're having like a big code base or it's a big uh, GitHub project, it's really important to review the code before it's merged into the main branch because it can, can mess up pretty bad. Um, but there are also people who are not working in teams. Um, so if you want to have feedback when you're working alone, there are always possibilities of unofficial code review. For example, using a repository or GitHub where people can manually comment on your code or also something like Stack Overflow where you can provide code as an answer and then people would tell you if it's like not really making sense or you can ask a question. And um, yes. Um, yeah, and, and there are also different forms of code review. I mean, you can, you, if you're sharing everything in GitHub, you can comment in GitHub. You can also just uh, email around some code for comments. You can, I mean, it might be, different now, but you can always like look someone over the shoulder and like go together over some coding. Um, and sometimes it also, there's also an option of a paired programming when two developers work like side by side on the same project. Um, yes, and that's uh, pretty much all this chapter was about in the book. Sorry, I, I was muted. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was great. I, I am very excited that we are one week away from making it through this book. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other comments or questions about this chapter. Um, uh, <laughs> Gus has a comment. Go ahead, Chad. I, I have like a question related to using use this. In the VS code, we it's very easy to generate a GitHub repo or edit it. So can we compare this to like a VS code or I, it's only like an R thing? Um, use this works with uh, not just our studio, but it is just for R. Um, it's not like, like I said, 
Yeah, I'm sure it is very easy to generate it, but to set up the upstream properly and to make sure that you have merged, uh, that you don't have merge conflicts and um, all the things like that, use this helps you avoid it. That uh, even if baseline creating the repo is not necessarily difficult. Um, so I am a big fan still, even if you have a straightforward way to just do the commands. Um, but I don't, I don't currently work outside of our studio, so I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, comparison to make to other ways of doing things other than what I see with people working on book clubs. Okay. Yeah, it seems interesting. I should read into it. Writing <laughs> like using this in our studio. It's mostly it's you have to really buy in to the whole process that they have and use this where you when you're like um uh, uh starting work, you do a PR init that creates a branch. It, for, well, it makes sure that your local copy is up to date and then it creates a branch so that you can't accidentally be working on something that won't sync later. Um, and then it has like PR push. And again, that will check to make sure, oh, can you push? Is this going to work? Am I pushing to the right place? Is this, you know, is everything gonna make sense? So, um, and then, then PR finish, which like closes out your branch and make again make sure that you're up to date with the um the main branch um very helpful and then um gus mentioned cunningham's law that states that the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question is to post the wrong answer um sadly that is often true <laughs> um but it won't might not necessarily get the right answer in the way that you want it <laughs> <laughs> like it can be very stressful in that way. So, uh, um, yeah, that is definitely something that I have seen that people definitely want to correct, and and I've seen people do it on purpose. Um, I, I'm sure I've actually done something at least once where you just tag someone who you know knows how to do it, and like, hey, I'm thinking of doing this, and then they'll give you a big long reply about, no, this is the way you should do it. Go, oh, thank you. That's what I actually wanted. <laughs> oh. That's smart. Um, anyway, cool. Well, I'm, I officially signed up for next week because um, uh, Kunta Kim's been signed up the whole time, but hasn't been here since I think week one. And so I, uh, I took it. It's on efficient learning. There's a little bit out of date. I just, I took a quick look. Um, there have been some things that have come into existence since this was written and um, Swirl still exists. I haven't seen a whole lot of people using Swirl recently, but um, I, I'm gonna actually dig in a little bit and see how much I would change the recommendations in this <laughs> chapter at this point, because it, it is older. There's now the tutorial tab on uh, or in our studio that is underutilized. Um, and the learn our package. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll dig into it a little bit and see if I have any updated recommendations there. And that'll be it. Um, I, I'm going to ping Colin because he was kind of following along early on and maybe we'll get him in for like a Q and a the, uh, the week after next, but uh, we'll see if he's available. I'm not promising anything there yet. <laughs> so, all right. And I will see everyone next week. Bye. Yep. Bye. 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 Bye.